Good morning, River Oaks Community Church. My name is David Kesterson, and I'm one of the elders here. This morning, our call to worship will be from Isaiah 52, verses 7 through 10. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has confronted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Let's worship together. disobedience, on whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 
so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's sing together. The work was done.
together. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit now with us. Every moment, all my days, God be praised. Oh God be praised. Yeah, 
one day. One day when heaven was filled with his praises. One day when sin was as black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin. Dwelt among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and the light shined among us. His glory revealed. Living he loves me. Dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified. Freely forever. One day.
Praise the Lord for uh, just worshiping uh, this way. Praise God so much. Um, our scripture reading today will be from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 1 through 19. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger, if you are snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. For you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go, hasten, and plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant. Go, sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise without having any chief officer or ruler she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest how long will you lie there O sluggard when will you arise from your sleep a little sleep a little slumber a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man a worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger, with perverted heart, devises evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Uh, this morning, before we pray for the offering, um, I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, the elders, uh, we are here for you. Um, if you would like us to pray with you or if there is any, um, anything we can do to serve you, please let us know. Uh, also, I ask that you would um, read the uh, rock email that comes out weekly. Um, in there, there are prayer requests. Uh, we just ask that you would be praying for those people. Um, also, uh, as we prepare for our offering, um, let me just uh, remind you that we have Easy Tithe, which should come up on your screen here shortly, uh, to go to it, or you can send a check to the church um, for your offering. And in that, we, uh, we truly thank you, and uh, we're, it's been such a blessing. Many of you have used Easy Tithe, uh, and that's just really been a blessing. So let us pray this morning. Father, Lord, we ask that you would bless the offering today. We pray that you would use it um, to glorify yourself, Lord, through us. We pray, Lord, that you would direct us in that way. We pray, Lord, that uh, as we hear your word this morning, that our hearts would receive your word. We pray that you would grow us closer to yourself. Also, Lord, we pray that you would continually grow us to be more like Christ Jesus. And Lord, I just want to thank you uh, for the technology that we have today. So even though we can't be within close proximity to each other, we are 
singing praises to you. We're worshiping this morning, and we get to hear your word preached. We thank you so much, Lord. And Lord, know how much we long to be together again. It's in your name, Christ Jesus. Amen.
Father, it is amazing to us to see the very practical way that you have transformed us through the power of the gospel. Indeed, you continue to transform us through the power of the gospel. And apart from the confidence that we have because of our union with Christ, that you truly do love us, we would be lost and discouraged. But because of who you are, and because of the love that we see demonstrated us in your word through Christ, we realize you do love us. And that sets us free to work hard, to be transformed into your likeness. So use this morning and this message and our passage in particular to do that work we ask in the name of Jesus, our beloved Lord, amen. So welcome to all of you who are able to join us through live stream. If this is the first Sunday that you've been able to join us, we have been teaching through the book of Ephesians, and this morning we will be in Ephesians chapter 4. Now sometimes when we study the Bible, the first challenge is simply to understand what a verse actually means. The minor prophets come to mind, or, or perhaps the book of Revelation is books containing verses that require both context and clear thinking in order to decipher their meaning. Before we can begin to think about how to apply difficult verses, we first have to comprehend them. But some passages are so straightforward that their essence is clear whether you are five years old or whether you are 65 years old, whether you lived in the first century or whether you live now in the 21st century. The challenge to today's passage is not so much in understanding its wording, but in obeying its warning. That is, to allow God's word to penetrate our hearts at the level the Holy Spirit really wants to challenge us. Our passage is Ephesians 4, 28. So hear the word of our glorious God. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Lord, please bless the reading of your word and use it to transform us, we pray, through the power of the Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. In the first century, to steal meant the exact same thing that the word means today in the 21st century. So you see, kids, I told you this was not going to be a hard verse to understand. But let's put it as simply as possible. The essence of our passage is this. Stop taking from others for your good and work hard so that you can give to others for their good. Now, that's pretty easy to understand, but it's, it's much, much harder to do consistently than it might seem, which is why we need the power of the Holy Spirit actively working within us. Now, this morning, in our passage, <clears throat> we'll look at the three natural emphases, taking from others, working like God, and giving to others. So let me ask you a very direct question. Would you consider yourself a thief? In the book Good and Angry by David Pallison, chapter two is, is only one word long. 
The title of the chapter is, Do You Have a Serious Problem with Anger? The one word typed on the page is, Yes. But since Mitchell unpacked truth and anger for us last week, let's, let's ask the same question, but, but with this week's focus. Do you have a serious problem with stealing? See, the problem we have with thinking about ourselves as a thief is that we have an image in our mind of what a thief looks like. We tend to think of the guy in the Simply Safe home security system commercials who, who talks about the product as he goes about his normal day at home, from bathing to dinner with his family, wearing a black ski mask the whole time. The commercial's funny, and it's designed to be. The problem is that if we primarily think of a thief as someone who, who breaks into houses wearing a ski mask or, or wearing a hoodie, or as a person who embezzles money from a company, we have a really hard time claiming that label for ourselves. But the essence of stealing is much subtler and far more sinister. So do you have a problem with stealing? The answer to the question is yes. The reason it's important to think hard about where we are tempted to steal is because the heart issues regarding theft run much deeper than our observable behavior. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus showed us that when we express anger toward others, it flows from a murderous heart. He also vividly demonstrated that an adulterous heart can be present even if a physical act has not transpired. In a similar way, stealing can be present in multiple forms at varying levels of depth. Stealing is everywhere. Some estimates are that a third of the retail price you pay for consumer products is because shoplifting losses are just factored into the price. One of the main reasons that insurance premiums are so high is simply to cover all the fraudulent claims paid out by the billions year after year. With our taxes, we can withhold income, or we can inflate our expenses. Salary.com surveys workers every year, and 89% admit that they waste time at work every single day. Whether it's coming in late, taking long lunches, leaving early, or using social media, time can be stolen from employers in a variety of ways. The examples are almost endless. At a deeper and and darker level, purity and innocence can be stolen. As well as trust, honor, reputation, integrity, and even life. But perhaps the most insidious thing that we steal is glory. The desire to bring people down in the eyes of others is always linked to wanting to elevate ourselves in some way. At the, at the heart of stealing is selfishness. We are constantly tempted to seek our own glory even at the expense of others. When we, when we hear another receiving praise, we, we, can, we can feel the question rising up within us, just looking, just looking for an opportunity to insert itself. What about me? But any unauthorized raising of our own glory necessarily includes a lowering of the glory of others. The essence of stealing is, is when we take from others what does not belong to us and use it for our own selfish purposes. 
the most dangerous way that we do this is when we steal glory from God himself. In this area, we have all been found guilty. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, not my praise to carved idols. Isaiah 48, 11, for my own sake, for my own sake I do it, for how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Or perhaps the first three commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. In other words, anything that diminishes or transfers God glory away from the glory exclusively due his name is strictly prohibited in the strongest possible terms in the very first three commandments given to his people. Why? Why is God so adamant about this? It's because at the core of our beings, we are glory stealers. When we do not acknowledge God's presence, we, we steal glory from God because he is always the most important person with us 100% of the time. When we do not give God the credit for his provision, we, we steal glory from God because every good gift and every good thing comes down from the Father of lights. When we fail to praise God, we steal glory from God because he is worthy of praise simply because of who he is. The greatness of his glory is the reason why beings cry out in his presence all day long. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. We steal glory from God when we do not seek to spend time with him in prayer. Because when we fail to commune with him, we are expressing our confidence in ourselves, independent of him. We steal glory from God when we do not trust him in trials because, because we're elevating the bigness of the trial over the goodness and faithfulness and worth of the one who made us, the one who redeemed us, the one who sustains us, and the one who will one day glorify us in his presence. It's this reality that tethers our hearts to this passage because we see the propensity of our own hearts as we seek to rob glory from others and insanely even God himself. Now in the primary context of our passage, Paul is saying that among the people of God, sacrificial giving to others, not selfishly taking from others, should characterize the community of believers. Paul is challenging us to live out the reality of the radical transformation that has transpired within us. That is, to learn to walk in a manner worthy of the calling we have received as believers in Jesus. But the question becomes, how can those who are characterized by taking from others for our own own good become a people characterized by giving to others for their good? The answer is simple. For Paul, the radical is demonstrated most clearly through the practical. Paul's counsel, get to work. Ephesians 4 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing 
honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The Bible has a very, very high view of work. The very first sentence of Genesis 1 is about God working. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Then after 27 more verses of God making really cool stuff, God's first instruction to man is work. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, Genesis 1.28. In essence, exercise dominion over it. Jesus said in John 5, 17, my father is always working and I too am working. In Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, Paul says that we are to put off the old self and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God. In other words, as, as that relates to verse 28, Work is good, and we reflect the glory of our ever-working God when we work. At the simplest level, we seek to work like God works, honestly and diligently. One of the most powerful evidences of the transforming power of the gospel. Let me say that again, because that's a big intro to a sentence. One of the most powerful evidences of the transforming power of the gospel is seen in the attitudes and the actions of believers as they work. This is the foundation for for what became known as the Protestant work ethic. Christians understand that everything we do at work is testifying to the transforming power of the gospel. It doesn't matter what your job is. All of it serves the greater purpose of displaying the greatness of the glory of our God. Now, I I remember a brief conversation I had with Jill Pear's brother, Jeff, maybe a year ago or so after church one morning, we were talking about work. And Jeff is an air extraction agent, which just sounds awesome. But in other words, his job is to transport prisoners from state to state to other prison facilities. And we were laughing because you could describe both of our jobs, his and mine, in a very similar way. We both work to try to restrain evil so that righteousness can reign on the earth. Every job matters, and every job matters eternally. This is the way Tim Keller puts it. If the God of the Bible exists, and there is a true reality beneath this one, and this life is not the only life, then every good endeavor, even the simplest ones, pursued in response to God's calling, can matter forever. So my encouragement to you, my counsel to you, is to incorporate Psalm 90 and verse 17 as a regular prayer throughout your workday. Lord, establish the work of my hands. Yes, establish the work of my hands. When God is leading us and when we are working as unto the Lord, then every attitude displayed at work And every action performed at work counts for eternity. In the context of our passage, one of the ultra-practical ways that our work 
matters and can matter eternally is that when we work, we are transformed from selfish takers for our own good to those who give sacrificially to others for their good. And this characteristic should especially characterize the community of believers. The gospel and the cross in particular is both the foundation for this command of Paul and the means by which we are set free to engage in work for the good of others. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. It is interesting that Paul here specifically points out working with our, our hands. If a thief used to use his hands to steal food or, or other supplies, how, how beautifully and powerfully redemptive that through the transforming power of the gospel, those same hands are now used to bless others through hard work. If even a cup of cold water offered in Jesus' name matters for eternity, how glorious that a person who used to be defined as a thief, that is a stealer, that is a taker, would be radically transformed in such a practical way through the simplicity of hard work that he or she now becomes a person identified as a giver for the good of others. In the, the, the put off, put on dynamic of Ephesians 4, we see the power of the truths laid out in the, in the first three chapters of Ephesians put to work. We realize how crucial it is to rest in and to be fueled by these, these massive theological truths. It's especially evident when we seek to overcome the depth of particular sins. Telling the truth seems easy until you consciously try to speak with complete honesty 100% of the time. And so it is with taking versus giving. We view ourselves as hard workers until we actively try to make the best use of the time all of the time because the days are evil. Wise prioritization and true spiritual productivity are, are extremely difficult to maintain with consistency. Maybe we feel like we've been, tr been transformed from selfish takers to generous givers until an opportunity to give really does require gut-level sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, we need every truth from all three of the opening chapters of Ephesians to make it all the way through chapters four and five and six. The redemptive progression we see illustrated here in, in 428 specifically is that those who were dead in their trespasses and sins in which we once walked through our union with Jesus are now being transformed into a people who can rightly be described as God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in, Ephesians 2.10. It is by the grace of God through the cross of Christ that we move from the sins in which we once walked to walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. 
So think about this with me. What could more powerfully reflect the glory of our incomparable God than that people who were formerly and still periodically glory stealers, among other things, now, through the, the daily plotting of everyday work, are transformed into humble sharers for the good of others. That transformation doesn't happen easily. But what a reflection of the greatness of God and of the glory of the gospel itself. We radiate the glory of our ever giving, ever sharing, ever generous God who sacrificed the life of his invaluable son in exchange for the lives of glory stealers when we sacrificially give to others out of the abundance of what God has graciously allowed us to earn with our own hands. The foundation of the cross is the reason God calls us to sacrificial giving that reflects him. And the transforming power of the gospel is what frees us to respond to this call with joyful obedience. We demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel when we trust in the sealing presence of the Holy Spirit as we realize and repent of the depth of our selfish stinginess. We demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel when we fail at work and yet trust that we have truly and forever been saved by grace, that we are recipients of God's mercy and loved by God with the great love with which he has shown us in Christ. We demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel when we are passed over for a promotion or fail to get a raise, and yet we trust in the riches of the far greater inheritance we have in the saints, and we maintain an attitude that pleases and honors God despite our circumstances. We demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel when we don't know how we will get all of our work done or how to figure out the problems we are facing. And we cry out to God. And we ask him to le leverage his immeasurably great power on our behalf so that we might honor him with the diligence and the caliber of our work. We demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel when we are, when we are a force for unity at work. Even if we have been unfairly criticized by others, knowing that Jesus himself is our peace and that in his flesh he absorbed our own hostility in his body on the cross, freeing us to endure reproach without reviling in return. We demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel at work when despite feeling unfulfilled in many ways through work, perhaps even including our salaries, we trust that all of our efforts done in his name are part of the economy of his kingdom in heaven as he seeks on earth to fulfill all in all. We demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel when we resist the temptation to participate in evil with others at work and instead trust that through our simple act of trust and obedience, the manifold multicolored wisdom of God is being made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places even now. And finally, my beloved brothers and sisters, we demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel when we recognize that we are a part of God's workmanship and that through the simple act of working hard and receiving compensation for our efforts, we then generously, even sacrificially, give to others for their ultimate and our eternal good. And thus, the transforming power of the gospel 
is put on display in our lives in the most fundamentally practical way. Praise be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit for the the insanely radical and incredibly practical transforming power of the gospel to the ever-giving and abundantly generous and only wise God be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the massive anchoring truths that you have given us in Ephesians 1 and 2 and 3. They help us so much. And they are the means by which, which you demonstrate the, the radical, transforming power of the gospel through the most practical means imaginable. Lord, would you, would you cause our hearts now to joyfully and freely and abundantly give you praise for the reality of what you have done for us in Christ and the reality of what you are doing for us through the power of the Holy Spirit even now and help us to sing for joy at the future hope that we have that we will enjoy life together in your presence forever. And we ask this in Jesus' beloved name, amen. Let's respond.
So the truth is that we miss you all. And we're really looking forward to when we can get back together. As much fun as these folks are, we, it's even more fun when, when you're here with us. But thank you for serving us so well. They have sacrificed lots of time and served us incredibly as we've worshipped our Lord together over live stream. We'll communicate more this week uh, as information comes down from the governor about what the plans are for this coming Sunday. For sure, we will still offer live stream. It's not yet been determined whether or not we'll be able to gather together, at least some of us, uh, in this building. Be encouraged by these words, brothers and sisters. Let me pray this as a blessing over you. This is how Paul closes his letter of First Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go about your day this day in the knowledge of that truth. In Jesus' name, amen.